Hello and welcome to the bi-weekly meeting podcast for the OWASP Top 10 for Large Language Model Applications. If you'd like to stay up to date with our project, please click subscribe. And if you enjoy the content or have any questions, please feel free to comment and share. Now, on to our meeting. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining the latest edition of the OWASP Top 10 for LLMs. Um, I noticed that I forgot to update the title on this title slide. So it is, in fact, March 28th, not March 14th for our every other week meeting. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, lots of activity going on. So V2, um, it's been a bit of a slow burn getting V2 going, but this was kind of in my original plan as I wanted to build us a base to really jump off of for the next one. So we went through a pretty extensive brainstorming period. We generated hundreds of comments on our brainstorming Slack channel, uh, posted a summary of that. People have posted additional comments in the summary. I think that'll be a really good resource for us to go back to as we dive into the next phase of the product. The team charter. So we put the charter out for comment. Several people have added suggestions. There's been some good discussion in a Slack channel around that. Um, and I do want to come back to one topic that's cropped up, which we'll get to in a second about um, sort of our core identity. And then the last thing that uh, I wanted to go over today was the core team volunteer survey that I sent out recently. Uh, I am going to keep that open for a little while longer, but we've already gotten a lot of response to it, which is great. Uh, yesterday afternoon when I pulled it down and uh, started going through the responses, had over 60 responses, about 15 of them from existing core team members, and then 40 some from people who are not part of the core team, some of them new to the project, some of them names that I've recognized who've been around but haven't been on the core team, all volunteering to step up into larger roles. Um, so I'll give a summary of that in a little bit. Uh, but I want to come back to this question that I think is going to be core to our revision of the charter document. And that's the, the definition of what we're covering. When we started last year, um, large language model was definitely the center of the conversation and a very specific uh, set of technologies that came out around that that were um, generally completely text-based. And I'd say the first version of the list really exclusively focused on that, but maybe very little mention of, of related technologies. Since then, several people have noted we've gotten into a world where there's a very blurry line between, let's call it a, a pure text-based LLM, a multimodal model. Uh, you know, if you look at the modern versions of ChatGPT or any of these other models, they have image recognition, OCR built in. Um, they'll read not just text-like substances like a PDF, They'll take a JPEG. Um, uh, I think it's not long between before off the shelf models will uh, take a link to a video and um, interpret the video. At the same time, we're seeing um, some of these output models that were previously driven by somewhat related generative AI technologies now really being built on transformers. And um, the somebody mentioned the Sora video model is really, in a lot of ways, a, a special purposed LLM. So um, I wanted to discuss, get some opinions from the group, whether we want to stay tightly focused on on large language models and those kind of textural interactions? Do we want to include multimodal large language models? Or, you know, third option is broaden more generally to generative AI technologies. So I'll open up the floor. Um, we have a manageable sized group here of 20 people. So you can raise your hand. If you do, I'll try to call on people. Otherwise, just chime in. Love to hear opinions. Yeah, so I would say, this is Scott, so I think my thoughts would be in the space is that, as you mentioned, things have been evolving. Um, so 
for uh, for LLMs and multimodal is sort of the uh, where things are today. I, I wouldn't even go to say that it's you know we're still in the tech space, so we're in that multimodal model. Uh, so at a minimum, focusing on multimodal should be something that the, in my opinion, something we should you know broaden to because it's a natural extension. Uh, from the way that the industry talks about it, though, we do talk about multimo uh, multimodal, but more often the term generative AI gets used more generally to apply to multimodal right now as this is starting to evolve. So from uh, a industry perspective, perhaps looking at Gen AI as a forward-looking piece might be a good you know, forward looking, you know, protection for us, for the group as we move forward and as things may get more expansive, but still allow us to stay focused on delivering value around what is, you know, where we have been today and kind of evolving that. So that's, that's my thought. There is also the, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Krishna. Oh. There is also the new things are coming up, like the large action models. Uh, so, uh, so definitely, um, it, it definitely, uh, you know, multi-model and probably generative AI might not be a bad idea uh, as a moniker because these things are evolving very fast. And I think uh, a lot of the uh, security, this thing, this large action models, I think will be a lot more vulnerable than their, their security, their attack surface or the surface is much larger than the text-based models. I'll just stop chime in with a couple of the comments from the chat, and then I'll call on people who very politely raise their hands. So um, Andy Smith posts in the chat, um, he's on a train, but he says, I guess the answer depends on whether there are any new fund or any fundamentally new vulnerabilities that affect multimodal and broader gen AI. Uh, Chase says, echoing Scott's comments, I think we're headed for a more generalized generative AI if we work to incorporate the multimodal functionality, it will allow us to examine what the threat surface of the system as a whole is slash can be. Um, and he says, my gut feel is the fundamental bones are the same, just exploitable in different ways. And Eugene says, Gen AI is important, but LLMs would stay. Is it too early to transition the name? LLM specific security is still needed. Okay. Uh, Jason. I think I, I, I fall on the side of we should incorporate anything Gen AI. To Andy's point, though, we risk diluting the top 10 or we risk splintering into sub, sub top 10s, right? So maybe there's some that are specific to LLM or are specific to large action models that don't apply to other ones. My, my perfection is generative AI makes sense, but I don't know how we deal with the possibility then of Maybe we need to have different top tens for different things, or do we just have a more general one and throw the comp? Great comments. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think my comment is is really echoing what a lot of people are saying. I think I, I just want to add, from my perspective, I, I'm the Artificial Intelligence Working Group Co-Chair and Health ISAC, so I work with a lot of people who have a lot of questions around generative AI. And when I talk to them and I, I explain the, the OWASP top 10 for LLM, there's usually a little bit of confusion on the side of these cybersecurity practitioners um, where I really have to spend a little bit of time explaining uh, LLM's relationship to generative AI. So I think I don't, think we are ever going to be able to get away from uh, the fact that there's going to be uh, additional ways and models and, and development of this technology that we will eventually have, uh, you know, top tens that apply differently depending on, on if you're talking about uh, purely LLM versus generative AI versus uh, ones that include like optical character uh, uh, generation. But I think the move towards having this more around generative AI and trying to future proof the work that we do 
to keep it relevant, to keep it on the forefront of what people are referencing as, as the standard, I think it makes sense that, you know, as, as I think the first person said, um, we're, we're already in that space where when people think about, okay, I've got to come up with a, a testing plan. I've got to come up with a security path. I got to come up with security policies. We are already in the place where, where they're, th what they're thinking about, the tools that they're thinking about go beyond just basic LLM. So if we really want to be a resource to those folks that are, are hungry for that information, I think we do have to future proof. Uh, Ken. Yeah. Um, so this has been a good topic, um, uh, even in cloud security alliance work that I co-chair. I also, uh, in my book, uh, uh, Generative AI Security, I, my original title proposed to the publisher was LLM security. So they actually suggested me to change uh, to uh, generative AI security. I actually changed it uh, reluctantly. But mm -hmm. uh, on, in hindsight, that uh, I think that it makes sense uh, because, uh, like, if you look at the solar, like solar currently it's not just a transformer based. Transformer is really for the land processing, uh, kind of like a bird is also using transformer. A diffusion model, it's more for image video processing. So it's a kind of a, uh, diffusion plus transformer um, is used. And uh, also the old uh, blue transformer, generative AI model, like uh, GAN, GAN, VAE, uh, those uh, could potentially have was the vulnerability in the future, but we don't know, right? For now, like the, another thing I do have some concern is we already have the name for kind of reputation for OWASP top 10 for LLM. Uh, if we switch to Gen AI, uh, we need uh, a lot of kind of disclaimer explanation. Uh, maybe it's doable, but we already have kind of kind of brand name there, including the website LLM Top 10. So this is one of the concerns that we can uh, think about that. But uh, yeah, from the forward thinking, I think it certainly it makes sense. Uh, there is some more model uh, we're coming out, especially like Meta's uh, chief AI scientist, uh, Yang Lequeng, he said the language, people's intelligence is not just the language, right? He uh, cited an example, like if you start from point A, uh, walk for 10 feet to point B, and then you turn left, you go straight, and uh, you need the calculating your brain when you get back to your original point. Do you using language? Or do you use visual <laughs> in your kind of thinking, right? So he, he poses this. So his idea is that you have to have a mental kind of a spatial time model. Uh, it's also intelligence. So yeah, from this angle, uh, I would say that there's a debate also. Yeah, also the CSA also has a debate. Uh, we do call you our, one of our document, uh, the taxonomy document as LM. M as well. <laughs> so we're not moving to generative AI yet. So there's so many con considerations, but from forward thinking perspective, certainly, yeah, I, I think generative AI makes sense. Uh, Ashish. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so, you know, so I, I would rather divide this discussion topic into three dimensions. You know, one is where we are talking about, uh, you know, going deep into finding, um, you know, different types of attacks which are model specific, uh, you know, that's where we are talking about LLM specific, uh, uh, you know, attacks, right? That's one. The second is where now the industry is moving away from just being, you know, uh, a single prompt firing and getting a response, right? So the application architecture itself is evolving more, right? So, so can we spend more time in finding vulnerabilities within the application architecture, you know, where agents will play quite a lot of role, right? And the third dimension is, of course, expanding more horizontally going beyond just uh, text, you know, going to videos and others as well, right? 
uh, uh, so my suggestion would be uh, going a little deep into LLM itself, you know, justifying uh, more, uh, you know, from a depth perspective. Uh, I think the industry needs more time on the application architecture rather than just the bread. Uh, also, along with that, you will see other organizations like, uh, you know, ISEC as well as, uh, uh, you know, ML Commons coming up with a lot of AI safety benchmark, uh, many other initiatives around model specific uh, you know, uh, work which is coming up. So I think for OWASP to continue its own, uh, you know, mark, my suggestion would be going more, uh, you know, staying with LLM and spending more time with uh, the aspects of LLM itself. All right. We're going to wrap up this topic, but before we do, I'm just going to read a few of the comments into the record here. People are still putting things in. It's making me scroll around. Let's see, Gen AI is important, but LLMs will stay. Is it too early to transition the name? Does anyone have a Gen AI, but not LLM vulnerability off the top of their head to share? It'll be a fun debate for the channel. I would encourage people to go talk about that one. Would three lists like Gen AI top 10, LAM, I assume that's large action model and LLM make sense? I think right now, this is from Jason. I think right now we only need one list unless we can come up with some unique volumes. I think at this point it's just deteriorated into a chat. So um, I'd suggest feel free to go take this over to the um, channel we set up to talk about that charter. I'll post a link to that in the main channel for anybody after the meeting if you want to go hop on and continue the conversation. But this was great. And I will try and factor some of this into the next draft of the charter, which my plan is to kind of wrap up that comment period, maybe in the next several days, and then put out another rev of the charter for additional comments in the next week or so. Um, I see Aubrey raising his hand. Yeah, I just, similar similar topic, uh, only because I know these guys. I'm just curious if we are still kind of uh, trying to work with the ML top 10 as well, and would they be included in this new list or... Would we just be Gen AI and they'd be ML? It's a good question. Uh, I'd say we do have a number of members who cross-pollinated over to the ML group. Um, I do think that there's a different flavor of what they've been going after than what we've been going after. So I think there's definitely room for, for two lists there, but another good topic to consider. Cool. Just curious. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just briefly going to hit on the current state of the feedback that we've been getting from the volunteer survey that I put out. Um, I am really pleased with the results. So if you go look at the website, there's a little more than 20 people on the current core team uh, when we updated it for 1.1. Uh, so far, uh, I've had 15 people reply um, from the current core team saying that they would like to continue their roles. So uh, I'll see if I get some additional replies from folks who would like to stay, but I'm not at all surprised that a uh, few people uh, drop out or drift off. And we had the same thing between 1.0 and 1.1, but uh, uh, would be very happy to have all of these people continue on as part of our uh, or leadership team. So thanks to everybody on this list for um, re-upping. Uh, but the other really interesting part was... Um, I did put it out uh, to a general audience. I said, if you're not a member of the core team, uh, what are you interested in doing? Who are you? Tell us about yourself. I had so many responses that I decided, well, I would feed them to chat GPT and get some summaries. So, um, you know, in terms of what people kind of mentioned about their interests, um, people are definitely interested in security shouldn't be shocked uh, a lot of people just really offering to help in various formats which is amazing um llms uh, a lot of these people do have some existing uh background with owasp i know it's an interesting mix um myself i knew of owasp but wasn't really involved before we spun up the project it just seemed like a good home I think we have a good mix of people on the team who have a lot of history with OWASP and people who came to OWASP because of the project. And I think that continues. Um, and a lot of people who chimed in just saying they'd like to be part of this amazing team, which is fantastic. I asked people for their skills and background um, just so we could, for the people we didn't know well, uh, start to figure out how we could best make use of them. A lot of people um, said that they have security backgrounds, research backgrounds. 
several people who said they have leadership experience, which I'm dying to go exploit because as this group grows, um, having a little bit more of a hierarchy here, and that's something that we have been working on building, um, mm -hmm. that'll be great. Um, so just sharing that briefly, I am going to leave that survey open for a while longer because we have continued to get responses. Um, Aubrey just shared that out on the LinkedIn, which caused a, a pretty big spike in responses because not everybody lives on the Slack channel. So um, just wanted to share this as an update. Again, I'm going to let that run into next week, then I'll close it out share some results. And then within the core team, uh, we will be looking at some of the, the people who volunteered, um, looking at some of the particular roles that we need help on, and probably approaching people independently if we think that their skill set looks like a match for one of the gaps that we have on the core team. But overall, for any of you who did reply to this, um, every single person on there looks amazing. We are excited to have you as part of the project. Honestly, the best route to uh, deeper involvement and more leadership on the project is just dive in and start commenting and helping. That's how we built the original core team was just finding people who were active. So um, welcome to the project, everybody. Briefly, uh, OWASP top 10 at RSA. So RSA is coming up in early May. I think we're about six weeks out. Um, it's obviously one of the big places where security people gather. Um, as I recall, we managed a small in-person meetup at Black Hat and or DEF CON last year. Um, <laughs> I think uh, the group was newer and that was very informal. Um, we have some very formal ways that we've weaseled our group into the RSA program. So I just thought I'd mention these here. We'll do a lot more publicity on these, but we would love to get people involved in the project out to these and get people able to um, meet up face to face. So really briefly, um, I've been involved with submitting two sessions that we have gotten accepted. So there's a full um, session on um, the Monday morning uh, I'm doing that with Gavin, who many of you probably remember. Gavin hasn't been too active on the project lately, but uh, he wrote some of the really key top 10 entries, including breaking the log jam on prompt injection during the 1.0 phase that uh, frankly threatened to derail the whole project because half the people didn't seem to think prompt injection was a thing. Um, it's hard to remember back to those days, but that's how important developing this list has been. Um, uh, uh, Gavin and I actually got approached by the program committee as the result of a couple of podcasts that we did way back around the intro of the first list. And they just said, would you guys please do a session? Which I thought was amazing. Uh, based on that, I submitted a birds of a feather. Um, that's also Monday morning. It's Monday morning early. So if you're going to get in early on day one, um, would love to see y'all come out and meet us in person. And then I'll let Scott talk about it in a second, but Scott's been really busily agitating with the um, uh, committee at RSA to get us a real space to have a real serious meetup. So Scott, I moved up your slide on that if you just want to talk to this. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll talk to it. Uh, so yeah, so we uh, managed to weasel our way in through a couple of back doors, uh, being that we're kind of late in the cycle. Um, we were kind of tight on room. So we just found out last week that we were able to scare, to uh, scare up a space on Thursday to conduct a AI summit. Um, and that's going to be, uh, in the morning, it's a half day, uh, it's before Alicia keys. So although it's on Thursday, um, uh, people aren't going anywhere. So, uh, we should have a good audience for that good opportunity for people to participate, uh, working right now and finalizing the agenda. We have it out line of the agenda here just want to you know connect with folks on potential speakers idea obviously is to have steve kind of cover some pieces and we'll revise some of that but that's scheduled uh for thursday now um for people who are speakers i expect that we will end up getting and i'm working on finalizing this with the rsa team uh, expo passes in case you do not already have them um trying to get some free codes that we can use so people can get access to both the event and the um, and the show at least at an expo level, um, so that which will get access. So the good thing about this particular session is it is open to 
paid pass holders, expo pass holders, et cetera. So it gives us the broadest opportunity for a broad audience. Very cool. There'll be more details coming out as we kind of finalize things and uh, and get uh, get details to everybody for coming and joining. So the goal is to have a couple of sessions in the morning and then have an opportunity for the team to kind of meet up and do sort of an open meetup or open team meeting in the afternoon before Alicia Keys kicks off the close to the conference. Great. Um, anybody got questions for Scott or myself on RSA activities? Cool. Yes, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, Ken. Sorry, Steve. Um, I saw it's a red teaming with Gen AI. It's a good topic. Uh, is this like still open for us to submit a topic or it's uh, like uh, in terms of that or this is right now our internal list that I need to pull together for getting us going on the spot. So we will have an opportunity to tune it. So I'm open to um, to uh, other opportunities or other suggestions, but we do have a limited time frame to work with. Yeah. But I'd say to anybody, if, if you have a suggestion for a great topic and you're willing to pull together the presentation and lead the session, um, drop a note over to me and Scott. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we'll get back to Steve Scott. Thanks. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, Bandy chimes in, says, I don't know if I can get my employer to pay for a trip to San Francisco, but you're all on notice. Now you can go try. It's a good excuse. Love to see you. That's right. All right. Uh, rep reports out from some of the team leads. So we'll just dive in here and we'll see who dropped slides in the deck last night. Uh, this looks like Sandy. Yes. So um, quick update on the, the next version of the checklist. Um, I've received a few comments um, in it. Um, I have not been as focused on it as I wanna be. I have been able to trim down some of my activities so I can really put more energy into that. We did re uh, get a message from this gentleman who offered to translate it into Japanese. So um, I sent him a message today asking about the status. And also, I, there's some minor updates that I want to make to it. So hopefully I can get those in before he finishes tr his translation. So the next, you know, with the checklist, the purpose behind it, you know, the motivation that I had to create it was I wanted to create the tool that I needed as a CISO. Like, what do I do? The business is screaming at me that they need, they want this, my users want it. Like, what should I be worried about? How do I, how do I wrap my head around what the vulnerabilities and threats are? So it was really a, how to look at it holistically. Here's all of the tools. Here's where to get started. Um, the next version of it, I, I really want to help organizations prioritize. Like if you look at the NIST adversarial attack document, like it's huge like almost impossible. So how do we help businesses understand what the actual threats are and how they're being used to be uh, against our organization? Which leads me into the next slide, Steve. So part of um, you know getting that prioritization um, encouraged me to work with my great friend, Rachel James. You guys have probably seen her in a couple of the conversations on Slack channels. You know, she's a, just a rock star threat, cyber threat intelligence expert. And uh, she and I threw uh, around some different ideas because if you look at the MITRE attack and Atlas, it's, there's a big gap between the, the TTPs for MITRE attack and for Atlas. And so what we were trying to figure out is how do we close that gap? And so she had a couple of ideas and I'll just turn this over to her. Thank you so much, Sandy. Yeah. So what uh the the research that i've been doing extensively is in confirmed usage of ai and llms by threat actors and the uh unique um articulation of that using cyber threat intelligence language and uh forensics guidelines so there's and i've mentioned this before on a call there is some uh, serious gaps in existing best practices around detection and response capabilities for cyber threat intelligence and cybersecurity teams um, when examining attacks that could have been uh, aided by the use of AI or LLM. 
So this is really an attempt to, to br like Sandy said, to bridge that gap between the excellent work that this OWASP team is doing, the work that is being done by MITRE through the ATLAS and the ATT&CK project, and really bring all of that together in a way that's understandable for cybersecurity professionals that are uh, looking at sort of both sides of the coin here in how these systems are being leveraged um, in their environment. So really excited to be able to to work on this. There's it's a really unique space. I've uh, already gotten some really great feedback from a lot of intelligence providers such as Mandiant um, and CrowdStrike about the work that we have already started to do. So really excited to uh, uh, work with Sandy on this and and to be able to uh, create this bridge between um, these very important standards. Cool. Uh, questions for Rachel. You, if you want to go to the next slide, we could really flesh out what the what our objectives are. Go ahead. Yeah, perfect. So, go you want to go ahead? No, no, Sandy, go, go. Well, just, you know, sharing with the, the rest of the team, you know, what, what we're trying to accomplish with this. And then, you know, the last slide, we, uh, there's a, uh, actually a startup called Hypergame AI that is focusing on detection through honeypots. And I reached out to Phil Dursey. He is uh, interested in helping us with this. And uh, Rachel and I are meeting with him tomorrow. So if you'd like, you know, again, we're kind of building this car as we drive it down the road, but potentially partnering with uh, Philip and the work he's doing around threat intelligence for AI and then helping again, um, fill in that gap and presenting it, providing it to Sticks and Oasis as a, a consumable format that they can use so we can share this, you know, what's happening, how adversaries are actually using AI or attacking AI um, within their environments. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. So uh, for, for those of you who have seen Microsoft and OpenAI's recent article about threat actors that are using uh, LLM, they came up with a number of LLM-aided TTPs. So we're really building off of that work, not only to add additional uh, TTPs that we can um, influence the MITRE project to make sure that it is inclusive of this type of threat actor activity, but also to influence STIX and, and, and the organization behind STIX, which is OASIS. And if you're not a CTI person who lives and breathes CTI every day, STIX is the data format that CTI professionals and frankly, our platforms that we rely on for our knowledge management, STIX is the, the structure of the language that we use to express threat intelligence and threat data and, and uh, attacks. And what we've discovered is that the current stick standard, as well as this uh, uh, you know, gap that we're seeing between MITRE ATT&CK as it currently is and ATLAS, there's a space here to develop the type of language in a way that's standardized so that uh, threat intelligence platforms and other integrated systems can use that structured language to understand and share indicators of attack and indicators of compromise among organizations. So that's really what we're we're aiming for. Um, and as Sandy said, we have some really exciting opportunities in order to gather this data. Um, and and we're just really looking forward to to being able to um, contribute to both the OWASP community and the brighter broader cybersecurity at large with this work. Right, HISAC. Rachel's very involved with the HISAC community and sharing with the threat intelligence. So it, there's multiple places. Of course, um, Steve, you sent out the email from Cloud Security Alliance asking to partner with OWASP on this. So we're really seeing this as, as an opportunity to build this out and then help a lot of different organizations because this is a gap everyone has is kind of identified. Um, Sandy and Rachel, do you guys have more slides or do you want to take There's questions? just one more. There's okay. one more slide. <laughs> so just our, these are our goals. And yeah, we're open to questions. All right. Looks like Ken's got his hand up. So we'll like let him go first. Yeah, this is very interesting. Um, is the sticks, is the uh, JSL based or XML based? Kind of uh, six, six is, yeah, six is typically expressed in a JSON. Yeah. 
a JSON. Okay, it's uh, that's great. Can can be, it's better than uh, XML. Yeah, certainly. I think uh, the the Kurt is trying to uh, make uh, uh, the list of vulnerabilities uh, to be expressed in certain way that I think it's maybe a bigger a good fit uh, uh, with the, the effort here. The, it could be a joint effort between OWASP and the CSA and uh, also uh, with OASIS. Uh, this, that is, is really a something uh, can be very beneficial for the uh, AI community, uh, especially on the security. Thank you. Oh, that's very interesting. There is a uh, sticks data object. So in sticks language, there's sticks data objects and sticks relationship objects. And there is uh, sticks data objects and sticks relationship objects that articulate vulnerabilities. Um, so that's a really good point to uh, to make sure that we're also looking at the expression of vulnerabilities in these systems and making sure that the standard is is able to communicate them appropriately. That's a great uh, a great ad. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, it's a, the interoperability is certainly will help, uh, especially for the tool vendors and also for um, the the researchers uh, to uh, uh, kind of communicate. Yeah. Certainly. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, uh, Sandy, yeah, I, I think this, this certainly is something uh, very important. Great. Other questions or comments? Yep. We'll just say I see a few comments in the chat that are just generally supportive of this. So um, okay. anyone else? All right, Sandy or Rachel, anything you want to wrap up on on this topic? No, just I put the the channel I created on the first slide, the public channel. That so, if you'd like to jump in and join that channel and you know add conversation or anything, right there, uh, one down, one more slide. This one? No, the next slide. This ah, this one. Team, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So it's team dash llm underscore ai dash cti. All right. Very cool. Um, all right, Scott, I think this is back to you. Yeah, I think I wanted to just make everybody aware. And Steve, thanks. The, the whole team has been working to collaborate on what the next generation of our web presence looks to be. Um, working with the uh, OWASP team, uh, we've been able to you know get the team to basically the foundation fund our site. We want to make it easier for people to contribute. So a couple of things we're doing is where team is working to move to a managed WordPress offering. Uh, this be hosted and managed by the, the excuse me, uh, paid for by the foundation. Um, and it will be on an OWASP.org OWASP subdomain, which I think earlier conversation around Gener AI or LLM, what is a subdomain, will be a good conversation to have. We'll also retain the the OWASP top ten uh, the uh, for LLM that uh, Mike so so generously kind of set up and kind of help help get going at the outset and we'll be working with the team to kind of make that transition. So we'll be coming up with a new website which will make it easier for content contribution and ongoing management as we go forward. The goal is to get the transition start doing some of the transition this week. Um, I'll be sending out some credentials and then we'll work on who, what the operating model is going to be over time, um, because we want to make sure that it's a sustainable approach that we can all have input, but we're also managing, uh, the, uh, managing the, the content appropriately and, and access. We are using a managed service for security reasons, because we know the concerns around WordPress. And so that way we've got somebody who is always, always looking to ensure the site is secure. So more, more details to come, but we're going to make this first transition. Um, one of the things I want to talk about real quickly is a question that I've been getting is why uh, we talked uh, last meeting about doing, going after sponsors for the project that are specific to the OWASP project. One reason for doing that, or one of the key reasons for doing that is there are things that the foundation does bring to every project. Um, but there are also things that the foundation doesn't bring to every project. And so. As we look at what we want to do with the project, we want to build a sustainable project going forward. We just talked about 
generative AI and sort of our, our future, thinking about future proofing the way we talk about things, we also want to find a way to future proof the investments to support the websites, the outreach that we're doing. So I wanted to highlight this because we're getting to that point where I'm going to start looking to organizations and companies that we all work for to kind of look at how they might want to be interested in sponsoring the project. Uh, but I wanted to outline this kind of the, you know, why are we seeking this, which is also a, all, often a quick question that I get because this is a volunteer organization. So this is really the reason, you know, OWASP provides a lot of foundational components, our great community, but for us to sustain the growth going forward, there's an opportunity for us to, to invest in doing that including, you know, going after key initiatives that we need to maybe fund, either we're going to need to do some, uh, some on the data collection side, some uh, red teaming workshops, some outreach. So uh, this gives us a little bit more you know, facility to do that. Right. Does anybody have any, any questions or concerns about that? I wanted to at least tee that up for folks because I know I've had the questions before. And and Scott, what if we think we have an organization who might be interested in sponsoring and, and contributing, what's the best way to relay that information or connect you? So I will have a I will have a deck uh, that we can share so you can do one of two things. You or you can do both. You can just connect to me directly to them and I'm happy to go through the details. There are also a deck that you can forward to facilitate that. So feel free to reach out to me on the outreach channel. Uh, on the collaboration channel, I should put, I'll put that link. I'll put that channel in the, in the, um, in the, uh, chat as well for this, for this session. Um, okay. or just reach out to me directly. Keep it simple. Just, just reach, reach out to me and I'll work awesome. with you to get, get you there. Thank you. So we're getting ready to finalize the program. So as I said, outreach between now and RSA is actually one of the better times for us to kind of do that type of outreach. Um, the We do have a, a funding uh, target that we're working through, though we don't have all inputs on what the projects are we want to do. Um, we just need to have a target so we can start building that funding. Um, that center slide there gives you our current uh, draft. I'm looking for any other costs that we have. Our approach is not simply just to go out there and say, give us a big bucket of money and we'll figure it out later. That's not where we want to go. What we want to do is we want to have a budget that people can go honestly to our uh, sponsors because we are a volunteer organization say, here's where we want to invest our money. And here's why we're asking for the sponsorship so they can see where it's going. If we go over that, great. So uh, there's both four buckets that we want to do funding for both operations any kind of outreach that we want to do in uh, or engagement with standards, other standards groups that require membership or other items like that. Uh, we want to look at outreach, talking more about the uh, what the t group is doing, including covering things as much as uh, travel costs if we need to, to get speakers to locations, et cetera. And then also we want to look at initiatives. And initiatives may be something around uh, maybe we want to do a uh, set up a red teaming projects where we have like some continuous work. We may need some infrastructure to support that. That would be an initiative or we're doing data collection initiative. So that's the structure we want to put together, or put together for our funding. And we'll go out to our, our partners for that. And what they get for it is obviously recognition, participation. There's some badging and there's a set of costs associated with that. But that's all part of the deck. So is you have new things that you think about, new projects, funding areas in this context, shoot them to me, send to me directly, put them in the uh, industry outreach channel either way, and we'll collect them and make sure that we have a uh, an ongoing budget. The goal is to do sort of an annual budget target, uh, but given that where we are right now, probably half year. So what we want to go do as that's evolving, we'll get budget behind that. So we have a very clear way for people to see where their money is being spent. Great. Um, and then this is my last thing. And then I actually need to hop off. Um, the um, We've been working on sort of a, a third leg to the stool for our, our some of our documents. This one has been, I talked about it last uh, meeting, which is to provide more of a solution guidance in terms of the way that we're thinking about the categories of uh, technologies that can help solve some of these uh, solution areas for customers, for customers, for the industry. 
Um, and so the idea here is simply to come up with a framework that we can help express where the different solution areas fit that map to our, our LLMs. I have it, our map to the LLM top 10. I have an initial drafts I want to put out for comment to help shape the actual categories. Cause I think having the feedback from the teams and shaping how the categories we want to express them as a group will help organizations kind of not only understand the L top tens, the research that we're doing from a CISO perspective, but then provide them some neutral guidance on what types of solutions they can look into, starting first, first with the categories, then open source, and perhaps even some commercial offerings. Right. So I'll be putting that out for, for comment uh, before the end of the week, at least to start the categories. All right, questions for Scott? Cool. All right. Um, I think we, do we still have Aubrey? I think yep, Aubrey had I'm to here. Oh, all right, cool. He's just mobile, but he's here. So uh, your slide is up if you want to talk briefly. Fantastic. Yeah, I, so I had a, just a couple of things and uh, I, I am driving, so I'm not really looking. Um, I did put up there that, you know, I've had a number of different uh, PR requests from various people um, throughout, and I thought maybe it, it might be a good idea, not just for me, but also for the team to kind of track some of those. So I wondered if, if it made sense for uh, PR requests to be uh, get issues. That was kind of the, the first one. Any thoughts on that? Or, you know, if no one cares, maybe I, I'd like to just move to that. So... I did, you broke up when you made a comment there. So are you just looking to use uh, re using the request to be get issues to manage? Uh, yeah, I, I would think it'd be good to have some some actual tracking on the, the requests. Yeah, that'd be awesome. My, my thought. Okay. Okay. I, it, it made good sense to me, and, and I figured I'd run it by the, by the team in case some folks who were in Git all the time thought it was maybe a waste or, you know, confusing. Okay. Uh, just... When, right. when you figure out what the system is, I'd say clearly document it, put up the process on the wiki, yeah. and then announce it. Okay. Um, the next thing was uh, I did put in a, a, a Git issue for social icons um, on the on the web properties. I figured those would be simple ghost images of the applications that we uh, are available on. I mean, obviously, the, the LinkedIn is, is the big one, right? We've got... Uh, 1,875 strong as of today, uh, which is a pretty sizable number for the amount of time that it's been out. Um, in addition to that, the, the YouTube is good. I mean, it's, we have a lot of subscribers on that. The Instagram is there, X is there. Uh, and even our RSS feed, uh, I think, would be uh, a fantastic addition to that. Um, RSA, I would love it if, uh, if people would think about things, if you're going to be at RSA, Think about things in this project that are important to you, that make things good, or that how this project makes things better, because I would really love to collect as many 30-second to one-minute clips as possible. Um, I won't just kind of push them out onto socials immediately, but these could be used, you know, throughout the year. That's what I've got, and if anyone has a minute, uh, I've still got a few minutes. All right. Any questions for Aubrey? All right. All right. Uh, quick update from ads. Um, <laughs> ads in short says, sorry, been busy, been traveling. Um, but he says he's psyched to get back and dive in. And um, I've been talking to ads about him doing a lot more work on 2.0. So I'm excited to have him back. And this is Jason. So Jason, I think you're the last slide. So wrap us up. Uh, so, you know, the artist might leave a current state of document publishing pipelines. We have several of them currently. Uh, so the main document is using Figma. Uh, the governance checklist is using uh, LaTeX templates that I created based on the, the Figma talk. And the translations variously are using a process that I think Talish has, has created. As we go into V2, we need to standardize that process, I think. And ideally, come up with one consistent process that can be applied across the board. So, let's figure out what the requirements are for that, what people are comfortable with, and I guess 
just an invitation to come on, hang out in the email and file channel and let's, let's patch, patch through this. Fantastic. All right, folks, that brings us right up to about top of the hour. Um, I want to thank everybody who contributed to the conversation today. Really lively meeting. So lots and lots going on. Yeah, I won't go through trying to wrap up a summary of everything, but uh, I will just say again, uh, RSA, now is the time to lobby to get your travel approved if you can come out and hang out with us because we will have some great venues to meet up in person. I may spin up a channel just for folks who are coming to RSA as a way to coordinate around some of these activities, um, but lots going on. And again, we just continue to see it week in, week out. Lots of great activity around the list. Um, uh, recently, I've been talking to CEOs at companies that have sprung up to try and handle you know, LLM security issues, and they all say... Look, all people want to talk about with me is, can you help me with these top 10 LLM issues? And so clearly we've gotten under the skin of the whole industry out there. Um, oh, Emmanuel's got his hands up. Um, yeah, Steve, I, I put a quick slide if you oh, can move. Yeah, sorry, go. I didn't um, see that one. All right, go ahead. That That's okay. It's just uh, I updated the wiki. And I manage, this is a little snippet of the code that I've been writing. So it's a code that can be used to validate um, what uh, our vulnerabilities are in different uh, environments. Obviously, they need to be custom made and adapted using some uh, other tools to integrate and uh, automate how they're going to validate back to our top 10. So please have a look everyone. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to criticism, uh, comments and uh, suggestions so we can move things along. Thank you. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna make sure there's not, nope. All right, that really was the last slide. So at that point, gonna wrap it all up. Thanks to everybody for all the great work. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye. 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 Have a nice. Thanks. Thanks for checking out our bi-weekly meeting podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date on all of the latest news for the OWASP Top 10 for Large Language Model Applications, please click subscribe. And of course, we'd appreciate it if you'd share with a friend to grow our community. We'll see you in two weeks.